Good, fantastic. Hey, could you stand up? We're going to sing some songs and praise Jesus this morning. I hope you're ready to sing. Are you? Yeah, absolutely. All right. First Peter 1, 18 through 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from an empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Join together and sing it out. Also.
Jesus this morning.
Mike, Mike. Good morning. I'm sure uh, the most most of us have been camping at one time or another and experienced the uh, camp bandits. Well, we were camping down at uh, New Harmony or Harmony State Park one time, and uh, we had I'd had about enough of them tarp straps over the coolers and all that kind of stuff and they were still ripping the tarp straps off and you'd see them come up at night we were we tent camped didn't ever camp in a camper so you could hear them out there pretty easy the uh i had decided to get rid of them and was going to sleep in the back of the pickup and some people might say i was loaded for bear i would say i was loaded for raccoons. I had hammers and pry bars and everything else laying beside me and when they came I was gonna be winging some ammo at them. We uh, got dark, went to bed that night, sat around the fire, told stories, all that kind of stuff and then we were, I was in the back of the truck and the girls and their friends and everybody was in the tent and it was time for the ranger to come by. The, uh, the raccoon was standing on his front back legs up against the picnic table and the ranger's headlights hit the uh, raccoon and the shadow went on the side of the tent and it looked like he was about that tall. <laughs> and I don't think the girls were asleep yet because you've seen the cartoons where the house swells up and the tent actually swelled up because they screamed and I started winging my ammo but the uh, we all like to sit around the fire and you know tell stories and that kind of stuff while we're camping uh, wiener roast and that kind of stuff but no matter who's there we always warn them stay away from the fire you'll get burnt you know the little kids you grab them back and I always had a five gallon bucket of water by the campfire. Well, just waiting on somebody to get burnt. And uh, so we'd, we'd warn everybody and they would uh, stay away from the fire. We never did have a severe burn, a few little nicks here and there, but we always warn people. And I wanted to talk this morning a little bit about warnings. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security has developed a warning system. And if you're in the green zone, you're pretty well okay to travel. It's a terrorist alert. If you're in the orange or red, probably better really stay home. If nothing else, you need to watch out wherever you go. So uh, a lot of us live like we're in the green zone. Instead, we're somewhere in the orange or red zone with the things we do. We might flirt with somebody even though we're married, uh, dabble with our uh, addictions, thinking that we have strength enough to stay away from them. Entertain someone or be with someone who likes to share the latest gossip we live with as if there's we're not in any danger when the enemy wants to take us down satan is a good strategist and he likes to work on our weaknesses in the dark the good news is we're never alone and god has the best set of night vision goggles ever made all we have to do is ask for help to stay away in Mark 14, 38, it says, Stay awake and pray that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, most of us have areas in our lives where we're weak and we need to pay attention to the alert system. Remember, the farther away you are from the fire, the harder it is to get burned. Let's pray. 
Dear God, we just thank you for the many blessings you give us. Thank you for what your son did. Thank you for forgiveness of sins. Thank you for this time when we can come to you, confess our sins, and get right. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's pray once again. Dear God, thank you for the blessings you give us each day. Thank you for the way you support us and care for us and love us. Thank you for uh, the Bible that we can read and study and pray each day. Thank you for the message that we're about to receive and our visitors. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'm not Mark Richardson. And I thank God every day for that. Um, (laughs) Guaranteed laugh. Um, I'm here because I want to introduce our missionaries for Casas Por Cristo in just a second. Um, But mainly because uh, in a couple weeks, a few of us adults are going to take a bunch of rotten kids down to Mexico. And uh, that costs some money. And I'm actually not asking directly for your money. uh, Because if it was just about money, we'd do bake sales and car washes. Um, what I'm asking for you is to be part of this. Um, if you would like to go and have a passport, we would take you even now. Um, but since most of you can't or aren't in that position, um, if you could help, uh, by, if you feel led, give some money to help us uh, get there because the house costs quite a bit. We're actually doing a little bit extra this year. We're putting in a bathroom or setting it so they can get an indoor bathroom, and that's a, a big deal. It really is a big deal. Um, But mainly, I want you to be a partner in this because it changes lives. And not only does it make a life change for the family that we're building a house to, for, that we're giving a house to, but it changes the lives of the people who go on this trip. And as case in point, uh, Travis and Roberta Sanders, it was Roberta Richardson at the time, uh, they were a couple of those rotten kids that went on one of those trips a few years ago. And now they're our missionaries to Casas. So if you guys would come up and give us a little bit about what they're doing. Does that mean I'm not rotten anymore? (laughs) Oh, good morning, everybody. We're super excited to be here with you guys today. Um, So I wanted to give you all just a quick update about Casas Por Cristo and how things have been going um, with our ministry. So first off, Casas Por Cristo is Spanish for Houses Because of Christ. What we do is we build homes for families in need in Latin America. And our mission is to build and serve. We exist to open the door for local pastors to share the love of Jesus Christ through service. Um, Now, most of the families that we build for, if you go to the next slide, um, they live in a home. um, Go to the next one, sorry. 
that looks something similar to this. Um, they might have a dirt floor. Their house might be made out of pallets or scrap materials, whatever they can get their hands on. The average family makes about $60 per week for a family of four or five people. As you can imagine, that's not a whole lot of money to cover all of your basic needs. Um, so housing, food, education, all that good stuff. Um, $60 doesn't go very far for a, a week. Um, so what we get to do is we get to come in and relieve a family of their greatest financial burden so that they can use the money that they do make to cover some of those other expenses that they have um, to provide for their families. Um, so we build in five locations. Um, two of them are in Mexico, Juarez and Acuna. And then we also build in Guatemala, the Dominican, and in Nicaragua. So those are the five locations where, where we currently um, build homes. And we have hopes to expand to 12 more Spanish-speaking countries in the future. Um, so I want to give you guys a quick update on um, just kind of how things are going. So 2020, COVID hit. That was pretty scary for us. Um, most of our funding comes in through the trips that are happening. And if trips can't happen, that means funds don't come in. So when travel kind of came to a halt, that was pretty terrifying for us. We um, struggled, had some meetings, tried to figure out how we were going to keep our doors open. But God is so faithful, and he has been so good to us. He made a way. Um, when we couldn't see what it was, he made a way for us to continue doing ministry. So um, praise God for that. We have come out on the other side of COVID and we're doing just fine. In fact, this year we're planning to build currently 217 houses for the year, which is pretty exciting. It's really close, hopefully, to where we were pre-pandemic. Um, by the end of the year, we should be close. So that's really great. Um, we also have 12 interns coming to join us this summer. Um, so they're um, helping us through our busy, hot summer season. And it's always nice to have a little fresh meat to help with that. Um, and then, uh, as you can see, this building up here, we completed our A Time to Build campaign this year. Hallelujah. <laughs> it was a long six-year process of building two new buildings on our property. One is mostly warehouse space, and the one you see here is our administrative offices. It's also where we have a team lobby, a store, bathrooms for our teams to be greeted in when they come to visit us. It's nice and air-conditioned, so we're super excited to have a facility that we can use as a launch pad for ministry for many years to come. So that is the new building. And then um, the last bit of news is that Nicaragua, we had to close it down during COVID. We weren't allowing teams to go there because um, U.S. airlines are not flying there currently, and there were a lot of COVID restrictions. But thankfully, um, we have a new missionary couple moving there in August, and we should be able to reopen that location this fall. So that's really exciting, um, exciting news for us. So you can be praying for that transition that this new missionary couple will be able to hit the ground running and um, be ready for our teams pretty quickly. Um, and then I want to share one quick story. Um, up on the screen, you'll see a photo of Eduardo and Sarai Martinez. Um, our executive director, David Robertson, went to build them a house earlier this year. And when he pulled up to the site, he thought, well, this looks familiar. He had built a house on that very work site about a decade ago for a mom, dad, and a little girl. Well, that little girl is now all grown up. Her name is Sarai, and she has a family of her own now, a husband and a little baby boy. And he was getting to build a second house on the property for her new family unit, which was really cool. And so throughout the week, he got to ask her some questions, and he asked her, what did it mean for your family to receive this house you know, over a decade ago? And she said, well, it was really amazing to have a safe and secure place to grow up. I just remember feeling happy here. And um, then he asked her a little more, and she said, well, it actually is the whole reason that I was able to go to school to continue to receive an education. And now she's still studying, and she has a plan to create to finish a career track that is her dream. Um, so none of that would have been possible if a team hadn't come down and built a house for her over a decade ago. And um, so it's just super exciting to get to see a little bit of the fruit of our labors, to see the kind of impact it had in her life. And hopefully it will have the same kind of impact in her little boy's life. Um, in the future. So uh, we're really excited to get to build with the Parkview group coming down in a couple weeks. They're going to get to have that same kind of impact in a family's life. Um, so be praying for them. And if you ever get the chance to come build with us, please come. We would love to build and serve with you. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to say a quick thank you uh, to all you guys. Um, you've invested in us roughly 38 and some change years. Um, around these parts, and just like the story that Roberta just shared, 
Um, you guys are a part of our story and a part of the story that happened there because of the way you've invested in us with prayers, with finances, with um, just helping us become who we are. Um, so we would not be able to be doing our work without you guys and a whole lot of other wonderful people in churches um, that have come along and worked with us. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And like Roberta said, if you ever get to come, please do. Um, I've had very few people regret coming. There's probably a couple, but generally it's just one of the best experiences that you can ever do. And I think it's because we're getting to do what Christ calls us to do, which is love, love the people he puts in our lives. And we get to do that in such a huge way. And once again, a lot of that is because of you guys. So thank you so very much. So I think the trip leaves July the 9th. We're still looking for a few good people. I'm looking this crowd over. Yeah, maybe. <clears throat> so it really, if, if you'd like to go, you can still get in. I think they're leaving July 9th, and if you can't go, maybe you can help send. Okay, and that's I, I'm going to be a sender rather than a builder this year. <laughs> My building skills are such that it's always a good trip for me. <clears throat> How you doing this morning? Hey, everybody, everybody, take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. Going to be okay. We're going to look at uh, the story of the Exodus and the story of the Passover today. There are certain moments in life when they occur, they're worth celebrating over and over again. So if you're married, hopefully, you're at a wedding anniversary comes, I always tell people when I'm marrying them, a lot of times, hey, remember this, about a year from now, this date will come back, okay? And I tell the young man, it'd be good to remember that date. It's gonna be important, okay? Worth celebrating. I think that's, that's words of wisdom. I right? just, if you're not married yet, you write that down, that's, that's a good one. Uh, sports team does well. Anniversary, by the way, is 2022 this year. Okay. I'm up to date. Which is the 40th anniversary of the 1982 World Series Championship at the St. Louis Cardinals. And we're celebrating all year long. Okay, you go to, you go to, go to the ballpark St. Louis, we're going to celebrate all year long. Because you don't win every year. You got to win that year. If we celebrate those things. Next Sunday is July the 3rd. It's the day before the 4th of July. We're going to celebrate the independence of America. Uh, we, listen, there are a lot of problems in this country. But it's by, by far the best country in the world. And we celebrate our independence, and uh, that's a good thing. Last Sunday, not everybody was up on this one, I think, but it was June 19th, which is a new holiday, Juneteenth, which is a celebration of the Emancipation Proclamation, which occurred for you history buffs on April 1st, or January 1st, 1863. Abraham Lincoln signed that Emancipation Proclamation to free the slaves in America. But... The people in Galveston, Texas, didn't hear about it for two and a half years. It was June of 1865, for the, which just tells you folks in Texas are a little slow. <laughs> there you go. A couple of Texans in the crowd. But they celebrate because it's the freedom of slaves. And the Passover celebration is the freedom of the Israelite slavery in Egypt. And that celebration still goes on every spring. It's been going on for 3,300 years. And it starts this way. <clears throat> It's the most celebrated story of the Old Testament, and it really gives a picture of the New Testament, the greatest story of all. Exodus chapter 5, God told Moses, go talk to Pharaoh, and he told Pharaoh, God, the Lord God, Yahweh God says this, let my people go worship. And chapter 5, verse 2, Pharaoh answered, you ever say anything, I wish I hadn't said that? Ugh, it stuck my foot in my mouth. And Pharaoh said, and who is this Yahweh that I shall let the slaves go. And the rest of the book of Exodus answers that question, who is this God? And he answers in a pretty forceful way. Exodus chapter 7, after that encounter, God encouraged Moses. He said, I'll bring down my fist on Egypt. I will rescue my forces, my people, the Israelites, the land of Egypt with great acts of judgment. Those are the plagues. When I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know. I am the Lord. You want to know who I am? God says, I, I'm, I'm going to show you who I am. And so for nine devastating plagues, things like you can't imagine, God has shown who he is. Now, chapter 11, verse 1 starts this way. The Lord said to Moses, I will strike Pharaoh and land of Egypt with one more blow. After that, Pharaoh will let you leave the country. In fact, he'll be so eager to get rid of you, he'll force you to leave. I mean, I got, I got one more arrow in the, in, the, in the bow, one more arrow in the quiver. 
I'm going to shoot this one, and he's going to let you go. Verse 4, Moses had announced to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Here's the last plague. It's a terrible one. At midnight tonight, I will pass through the heart of Egypt. All the, now think about this. All the firstborn sons will die in every family in Egypt, from the oldest son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, to the oldest son of the lowest, lowliest servant girl who grinds flour. Even the firstborn of all the livestock will die. Then a loud wail will rise throughout the land of Egypt, a wail like no one has heard before or will ever hear again. COVID was pretty bad. Okay. I don't know how bad it's going to be at the beginning, but a lot of folks have died of COVID. It's just been pretty. And we, it was airborne virus when we first got it. Remember, my wife wouldn't let me touch a gas pump. Thought I was going to get infected from the gas pump. Anybody, I, I told her, it's an airborne virus. I don't think that's how I'm getting it. I got it from her. <laughs> Not the gas pump. But, but it's, it's, been a, it's been a bad disease. It's been rough. And lots of people have died, but not like this. The firstborn male in every family and the firstborn of the cattle were all going to die, not over a period of two and a half years, but on the same night. Terrible. And God said to Moses, here's what I want you to do. So you don't, you're not part of this. I want you to kill a lamb. Take not, not just any lamb, but the best lamb you have, unblemished and spotless lamb. You get that lamb ready, prepare him, and then on the 14th of Nisan, or the 15th of April or something like is a spring holiday. I want you to do this. I want you to kill this at a certain time. I want you to kill this lamb. I want you to roast him whole. Now, when they killed... All right, children. Children, ignore this. But when they kill, kill the lamb, first of all, they would slit the throat and bleed the... And that's what still happens. They blood, they blood the animal. He said, catch the blood. You're going to roast that, that lamb whole, but you take the blood, take a hyssop branch, and it's like, like a paintbrush, and paint the... the the doorpost of your house with the blood of the lamb. Okay, let me just ask this. Anybody, would you admit that I'm hearing this story for the first time today? Anybody admit that? It's church, it's okay. Now, if you've never heard this story before, that's crazy. If you're hearing it for the first time, you're going, hello, God, what did you say? Kill the lamb, I got that, we'll, we'll roast the lamb. It's lunchtime. Roast the lamb. Let's have meat for lunch. But I'm okay with that. But take the blood and paint the doorpost of my house with blood? And God says, when I see the... Well, let me read for you. Chapter 12 and beginning in verse, verse 12. Here we go. On that night I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son, a firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I'll execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign... Marking the house is where you're staying. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. The plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is a day to remember each year from generation to generation. You must celebrate it as a special festival of the Lord. This is the law for all time. Do you suppose they were careful to get blood up on the doorpost? Don't, don't you suppose? I mean, God said, I'm, every, all the firstborn, firstborn men are, or males are going to die, except for I see. Do you think they were careful about putting blood up there? Can you help me a little when I preach every once in a while? I'm, think, I'm thinking, what, what, I don't think they put a little bit of blood up there. I think they soaked that hyssop branch and they, hey, God, when you pass over, look at the blood. Okay, go on down to verse 24. Here's how the chapter ends. Remember, these instructions are a permanent law. You and your descendants must observe forever. When you're in the land of the, his promise to give you, you'll continue to observe this ceremony. Then your children will ask, what does this ceremony mean? What are we doing with this lamb and by the way, when we have kids in church and the Lord's Supper, we, we take the Lord's Supper. He got that, why are we doing this? Why can't I have some? When the children ask, he says, what verse was that? Verse 27. <laughs> what ceremony mean that you will reply, it's the Passover sacrifice to the Lord. For he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt. And though he struck the Egyptians, he spared our families. When Moses had finished speaking, all the people bowed down to the ground and worshiped. So the people of Israel did just as the Lord had commanded the, through Moses and Aaron. And that night at midnight, this was awful. The Lord struck down all the firstborn sons of the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne, the firstborn of the prisoner in the dungeon. Even the firstborn of the livestock were killed. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the people of Egypt woke up during the night. Anybody wake up last night? About 2.30? Yeah, how about that? I don't know why. It was booming at my house. 
And this night, it wasn't a thunderstorm that woke him. Listen, they woke up during the night, and loud wailing was heard throughout the land of Egypt. There was not a single house where someone had not died. Now, that story is the Passover story. It's a great illustration of our salvation. And I'm going to give you two truths. The first one's real short. The second one is a lot, a lot longer. So don't, when I say number two, don't act like we're done. There's a lot more to go. Here's the first truth. It comes from the story and Passover in our lives. Number one is God will deliver judgment. You could write it down. You ought to write it down. You ought to remember it. God will deliver judgment. God is not your grandpa. <laughs> now, grandpa, that's a whole other deal. I, I, I'm, I'm low on the grandparenting gene. I didn't get enough of that. But Julie got enough for all of us, okay? She's, I, I'm, I was talking to a friend this week about grandparenting. <laughs> you don't mind if I tell this dude we're at the flower store the other day, and you don't care because it's too late now. <laughs> My grandson Harvey picked up a stuffed dog, and he had that, that cute little, oh, he's hugging the dog, and I, can I have this dog? Now, I'm glad I was there because Julie was just about to buy that dog. And I said, now, now listen, we don't need a stuffed animal, we don't want a stuffed animal, and we're not taking a stuffed animal home. How did I do? And, and you know, the parents are going, please, no more of that junk. And I, I, I said, no. Talking to a friend of mine on Wednesday, I told him that story. He said, you ought to go in our house. I've got a teddy bear that big. Because I was with my kids. They said, hey, I'd like to have a stuffed animal. I said, well, let's get a good one. <laughs> Can I just tell you, God is not your grandpa? <laughs> Grandpa's, oh, <laughs> he's not your grandpa. <laughs> He's really not. It, grandpa sometimes are tolerant of everything and everyone. God is not. Okay? And, and God said to the people of Egypt, I, I've had enough. And it was going to be judgment. And God will deliver judgment. The ten plagues make that clear. The Bible teaches a linear view of history, not, not a cyclical view, but a linear view that it's going, this world's going somewhere. You know what's going? Hebrews 9, 27, it's pointing a man wants to die. And then comes the great day of the great day of judgment. The preacher has to keep that in mind. Every time I preach, I know people listening to me are going to die someday and face judgment. By the way, we're having a funeral on Wednesday for Mr. Russ Giebler, having one on Saturday here uh, for Don and Betty Tharp. And like them, if Jesus tarries, you too will die. <laughs> and when you die, could I just tell you what's going to happen to you? You're going to face the almighty God, the judge. Now, I, I think the preacher has to keep that in mind. First, Second Timothy 4 says this, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead. When he comes to set up his kingdom, preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, encourage people with this good teaching. And that verse is convicting for me. My job is to preach the word. And I know that when people listen, they're either going to go to heaven or hell. They're going to face the almighty God who is the judge. And so that's, that's convicting for me. My job is simply to warn you. Ezekiel said in chapter 33, Preacher, you're like a watchman sitting on a watchtower. And when you see the enemy coming, you better warn people. And if they, don't, if they don't respond to the warning, it's not on you. But if you see them coming and you don't warn and they die, that's on you, preacher. And my job is to warn people. I don't know how. Can I just tell you that there is a God, there is a judgment day, and it's, and it's coming. It's, I, yeah, that's not, that's not much fun. I didn't expect it to be much fun. I'm not having a great time myself, but I'm telling you it's true. And woe be to me if, if I don't warn you. Now, I will say, of all the people I've warned, I think I have a pretty low percentage of people saying, yes, I'm going to get right. I think it's pretty low. But that's not my problem. My problem, my job is simply to warn people about what's going to happen. You think, well, preacher, that's all fine, but isn't that just Old Testament when God was angry? Actually, Nobody in the Bible talked about judgment more than Jesus. Parables, we love his great stories. He told a story about a guy got a net full of fish, and there were good fish and bad fish, and he threw away the bad and took the, took the good. There were sheep and goats, sheep on the right, goats on the left. He, the man went out to gather in the harvest. There were wheat and tares. He threw away the tares. There were ten virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish. And God is just, and evil will not go unpunished. God will deliver judgment. Now, that wasn't very good news. Here's the good news. God made a way to deliver you from judgment. God made a way to keep him out of judgment. He made a way for us. There is no partiality with God. 
And the judgment that fell on the Egyptians would have fallen on the Israelites, but God made a way to deliver them, and they followed it. Strange instructions and all, they followed. The truth is we're under the power of sin. We're all slaves to sin. We're powerless to face ourselves, and God made a way to deliver us. And so for about 1,300 years, from the time of Moses to the time of John the Baptist, every spring they celebrated this Passover celebration. It was a big deal. I mean, a huge deal. It was the highlight of their year, big family celebration, great festival of, to God. And then one day, John the Baptist was out in the wilderness preaching. And as he's preaching, by the way, they came. The crowds came to hear John the Baptist. He was a man on fire. And they came to hear him preach, great crowds. And Jesus walked down the road. And when John the Baptist saw him, he said this, John 1, Look, behold, the Lamb of God. And their minds immediately had to flash back to Passover. The Lamb of God, the blood that saves, this is the one. Their minds had to explode when he said that. And just like Passover, God's in conflict with an evil ruler, Satan, holds people captive, and we can't break free on our own. The Bible points to Jesus. It all points to Jesus. John 5, 24, Jesus says, Truly I say, whoever hears my words, believes him who sent me, has eternal life, he will not be judged God has made a way, but it's crossed from death to life. In John 5, 39, again, Jesus says, You search the scriptures. You think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. So the Passover is similar uh, to our salvation. I want to show you three ways God delivers. And it all comes out of the Passover. It's the same, same is true of Jesus. God delivers in an under-the-blood way. By that I mean this. If you read Exodus 12, 13, he says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. It's an under-the-blood way. The issue was not race or ancestry, social position. The issue was, and still is, blood. First Peter 1 Peter 1.18. You know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. It was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Romans chapter 3. Paul writes, everyone has sinned. They all fall short of God's glory standard. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Well, how did he do that? God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life-shedding blood. It is an under-the-blood way by which we're saved. We sang that song, that old song, there's power in the blood. Would you be free from your passion and pride? Would you be free from the guilt of your sin? It all is under the blood of Christ. So when I enrolled in college, it was a long time ago. I'm, I'm talking about so long. I'm going to tell you a story that it, for, for those who are under 25, you're going to think I'm lying. Okay. When I went to college, my sister Donna gave me as a gift a manual typewriter. Now, today, if you go to the Smithsonian Institution, they've got three of them left on display. <laughs> you didn't hook it up to anything, had no battery, had a, a series of levers, pretty cool. And when you, you'd be bang on that, and then the, the, the lever would come up and smack the paper, and actually smack the ribbon and then the paper, and leave an impression on there. And that was called typewriting. And that's how we wrote papers back in the day. Aren't you glad you're not doing that today? Now, here's the only problem with the typewriter. I did take typing in high school because I had a hunch I was going to go to college. So I took typing in, in, in high school, but I was never and still am not a very good typist. And occasionally, I strike the wrong key. The faster I go, the more wrong keys I hit. Now, in those days, back in the 1970s, <laughs> right before Dukes of Hazard. When you made a mistake, you, and I know you think I'm lying, you had something called an eraser. And you rubbed it on the paper. But don't rub too hard, you're gonna put a hole in the paper. You just, and and you gotta rub that off, try to get that off. And then you gotta bring the thing back and try to hit, get, make the, hit the right key in the right spot again. And you think, man, I, whew, I did. Then finally, some genius came up with whiteout, which is white fingernail polish that you put on your paper. Okay. And you let it dry a little bit, and you hit the right key. Very painstaking, slow process. <clears throat> now, today, I think I could pass college. <laughs> With a word processor and a computer and a printer, I think I could, you know, you make a mistake, just hit the back, boop, 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 hit that delete key, it's all gone. And when you produce a paper, it's beautiful. You know how my papers looked when I was in college? You hold them up to, I've still got a couple of them. 
hold them up to light, it looks like Swiss cheese. <laughs> what? And the evidence of the mistake is still there. Here, here's what I'm telling you. A, a lot of people, they look at God and they go, well, my life is like Swiss cheese. I made all these mistakes. Yes, you did. Too many mistakes. But guess what? The blood of Christ is the delete key. He, he rolled it all back, and now you hold it up, and you look pretty good against the light. Because he saves us by, it's an under-the-blood way by which we're saved. I beg you, I beg you, I want you to come under the blood of Christ. I want you to be forgiven. I want you, please, please come. Well, how do I do that? Well, if you were to ask somebody in the New Testament, they'd tell you this. You have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, like he said he was. Okay, you have to believe that. You have to trust him and not yourself, because you made a mistake. You made a lot of mistakes. You have to trust him instead of yourself. You have to repent of your sins, which means you say, God, I'm going to do it your way instead of my way. And then to symbolize that desire to serve him, you need to be buried in water, baptism, and rise to walk a new life. Listen to what he says about meeting the blood, Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, we also now live new lives. We have been united with him in his death. We'll certainly be raised to life as he was, united with him in his death under the blood. Galatians 3, all who have been, all have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. Colossians 2, you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. and With him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Can I just say this as plainly as I can? Water does not wash away sin. But baptism is a public declaration that I believe what he said. Listen, I, you, know, you know why the people were saved in the book of Exodus from the, from the Passover? Because of faith. They trusted God, and it led them to apply some blood on the doorposts of their houses. If you want to follow Jesus and you've not been baptized, I just tell you this, we're not singing a song of invitation. I'm not even close to done. We're not going to sing a song of invitation, but you can follow Jesus. I, we, we have a tub of water here. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you want to serve him, you get me on a way, we'll baptize you. I've got a little bitty pool in my backyard about a foot and a half deep. If you're scared I'd, you'll drown in here, we take you there, we'll baptize you in a foot and a half of water. That'd be fine. If you'd rather go to the Wabash River, I got time. I've been in there before. <laughs> you know why it's so muddy? The last person I baptized was a filthy sinner. There you go. <laughs> I'm not giving you their names. But if you want to follow Jesus, man, today's the day you, you ought to do that. It's an under-the-blood way. It's also an open-to-all way. When Israel left Egypt, they had some company with them. Chapter 12, verse 37 says this. That night, the people of Israel left Ramsey and started for Succoth. And there were about 600,000 men plus women and children. A rabble of non-Israelites went with them, along with the great flocks and herds of lions. Who, who were those non-Israelites who went with them? They were Egyptians who heard about passed over and said, I will too put blood on the doorpost of my house. I believe I, I'll do what he says. You know who Jesus came to deliver? It wasn't just Israelites. It came, he came for whoever. For God's love the world that whoever, I love that, whoever, you're, you're part of that, whoever believes in him will have life. To the woman at the well, Jesus said, John 4, whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. To the crowd that he had fed, Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I'll never drive away. To Lazarus' sister Martha, he said, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. This deliverance is open to everybody without race, ancestry, morals, social position. None of that matters. Now, the world doesn't operate on the whoever principle. It operates on the got to be good enough principle. I like what Rick Ashley said. Jesus came for the uns, the unappreciated, unnoticed, uninvited, unwanted. The gospel message is exclusive. Now, we get in a lot of trouble because we, we, I'm telling you, I've, I've said about as plainly as I know how that it's only the blood of Christ that saves. You don't, you don't stand a snowball's chance in hell on your own. Hello? Just, just as plain as the Bible says it. That's pretty exclusive. It is. Acts 4.12 says this, there's salvation in no one else. There's no other name in heaven by which we must be saved. 1 John 5.12, whoever has a son has life. Whoever does not, do you have the son? Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. First Timothy 2, there's one God, one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. And so it is a very exclusive way, but it's also a very inclusive way. That one way is open to whomever would come. You know, Jesus and the early church were criticized 
Not because they were too exclusive, because they were too inclusive. Because the gospel was good for men and women and Jews and Gentiles. Regardless of race or whatever else that happened in life, they were welcome to him. And not everybody will escape judgment, but all can escape the judgment of God. He made a way. It's not another blood way. It's an open all way. And number three, God's deliverance is an only by God way. You ever notice this? That religion makes people proud. Religious people aren't much, to be, much fun to be around. Hello? Could I just get a hello? Yes, somebody? Religious people are pretty proud people. They, they act like they're better than anybody else. That's, well, you didn't say it. I'm just telling you. I, I've known some people like that. No Jew or Egyptian left Egypt that night after the death of the firstborn and went away going, feeling like, look what I did. They went away joyful, they went away grateful, but they knew it wasn't because of what they did. It's all God and his deliverance. And so here's a prediction God says in Exodus chapter 6 about this deliverance. Say the people of Israel, listen to what he says. I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression, will rescue you from slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people. I'll be your God. Then you'll know that I am the Lord, your God, who has freed you. Who freed them? God freed them from their oppression in Egypt. It wasn't that Pharaoh said a sudden burst of compassion for the Israelites. It wasn't that Moses became a great diplomat and he reasoned with Pharaoh. God did it. That's the way we're saved as well. Ephesians 2 says, by grace you've been saved through faith, that not yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, that no one should boast. Salvation demands we admit our helplessness and put our trust in him. And so when you share your testimony of how you came to Christ, you make sure there's only one star of the story. It's not the preacher and it is not you. The star of the story is God. He is the one who did this. And so Galatians 6 says, As for me, I may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus. God will deliver judgment. One of the worst, best sermons I ever heard at camp was a bunch of high school kids with a guy, a guy we called Magic Jack Dowden. Jack Dowden, he had little, little magic tricks. It was a morning, it was hot, it was humid, sitting in the chapel. And Jack preached way too long, way too long. And he preached a real simple sermon. He, he, he preached a little bit, and then he'd stop, and, and his face would get red, he'd just scream, sin is sin. Hell is hot, and forever is a long, long time. And then he'd preach a little more, and we'd be bored to silly. And then he'd stop and go, sin is sin, and hell is hot, and forever is a long, long time. I thought he'll never quit preaching. He kept going, and about every three or four minutes, and he must have done it 15 times. Sin is sin. Hell is hot. Forever's a long, long time. And God's not your grandpa. Uh, and he just isn't. And God will deliver judgment. He promised he would. And then God made a way to deliver you from judgment. It's under the blood. It's open to all. It's only God. If you've never said yes to Jesus, I wouldn't wait too much longer. I'd get in today. God, thank you very much for this story that reminds us of the greatest story of all, the story of your love for us. And Father, sometimes we, we get all tied up and there's just one way and all that. Father, I'm thankful you made a way that you deliver us because there's no doubt that I deserve to be judged by you, that I'm not right, I never, never have been and probably never will be in this life. Father, I'm thankful that you sent your only son that I could be under the blood, that I could have life with you. Father, we want to celebrate some lives this week of folks that have passed on here from this church. We're grateful for their testimony of their lives. We're thankful for Jesus who saves them and us. In his name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. I have a few announcements for you guys. The first being the Mexico mission trip is coming up July 10th through the 17th. It's an amazing experience, a great trip to go on. You get to build a house for a family who needs it. You get to grow in your faith. And guess what? Roberta and Travis Sanders will be in the kids area during the Sunday school hour to talk about their work building houses in Mexico and other countries and the upcoming trip. So make sure to join us then. Parkview's 101 class is coming up on July 31st. If you want to know more about Parkview and what we are all about, what we believe, then please join us on July 31st here at the church.
Bo Belt is starting a new Sunday School class studying the Acts of the Apostles by Louis Giglio. If you are looking for a new Sunday School class, this might just be the one. Class starts today, so make sure to check that out. That's all I got for you guys this Sunday. We will see you next week.